It's the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. We're coming up on the 40th episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast, and I'd love to hear from you, the listener. Yes, you listening to this right now, I want to know what you think about the show. So I made a quick survey that you can take. It's only 10 questions long. You can find it at bit.ly slash survey or you can click the link included in the blog post for this episode. Again, that's bit.ly slash survey. Okay, on to episode 37. Willis Jenkins wanted to inspire Christians to exercise faith in God as well as in contemporary science, science which suggests that humans are damaging the earth God created. So he did like any good academic does. He wrote a book called Ecologies of Grace, which explores how being saved as a Christian is intimately connected with saving nature. But the book left him unsatisfied, so he wrote another one, this time taking a more pluralist approach. The urgency of climate change, he realized, can't wait for the world's conversion to Christianity. So his new book, The Future of Ethics, articulates a vision where people with radically different belief systems can come together to solve problems that impact everyone. It's an urgent conversation where secularism and religion aren't necessarily mutually exclusive categories or foes. Rather, they're overlapping visions of how humans fit in the world and what our responsibilities are toward the earth and each other. This is easier said than done. On the one hand, some more secular-minded people wonder why Jenkins wants to bring apparently antiquated ideas of religion into a scientific discussion, and some Christians and believers worry that he lets science dictate his interpretation of the gospel. In this episode, Jenkins joined me in person here at the Maxwell Institute to talk about his new book, The Future of Ethics, Sustainability, Social Justice, and Religious Creativity. My thanks to the Associate Dean of Humanities at BYU, George Handley, for helping to set up this discussion. Willis Jenkins, thank you for being here on the Maxwell Institute podcast. Thank you for um, the conversation. We're here to talk about a book you recently published called The Future of Ethics, Sustainability, Social Justice, and Religious Creativity. And the book brings religious perspectives into discussions about things like climate change and uh, and, and environmental issues. And before we dig into the book itself, I'd like to hear a little bit about your own academic and spiritual biography. Sure. So I am an, an associate professor of religious studies at the University of Virginia, which means that Uh, I study and teach religion academically, but it's also true that I I grew up in the state of Virginia uh, as a a conservative evangelical Christian, and um, while I wouldn't describe myself as uh, in those terms now, um, at least I I moved away from being conservative and evangelical, uh, it's true that, you know, what I I study and why I study it is very close to my my own faith. Uh, So I did my undergraduate at Wheaton College in Chicago, Um, and then... What was uh, your focus there? Yeah, uh, my major was in um, Biblical Studies and Theology. And um, I spent uh, a few years as a mission volunteer with the um, Anglican Church of Uganda then came back and did uh, graduate study at the University of Virginia in the area of of theology and and ethics. I got my PhD from the University of Virginia in 2006, um, focusing on environmental ethics, and then went to work at Yale Divinity School uh, and and was there for seven years before uh, the University of Virginia opened up a position uh, through an environmental humanities initiative uh, right in my area, so I have my my dream job in my my home university. Yeah, you gotta go back home. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. So the book, the future of ethics. That's it's kind of an extended argument and also a demonstration. I think that that the humanities and religion in particular can play a crucial role along with the sciences in con- confronting issues like climate change. And the title of the book is pretty audacious: the future of ethics. So let's lay some groundwork here, perhaps by kind of explaining what what the past of ethics kind of looked like. Sure, and th- let me first say that um, the title looks outlandish. <laughs> I don't mean it in the apparent blueprint sense that I'm offering um, a vision for what the future is, I mean it in a much more modest perspective sense, that the future of ethics is under stress and under construction by what we make from our inheritances. Um, So um, I guess to just offer one large generalization about the past of ethics in relation to the kind of problems that I'm interested in engaging is that it looked, the, the kinds of challenges the past of ethics broadly 
from the ancient world all the way through the 20th century, the kinds of challenges it faced were just at a different scale than the kinds of challenges that we face in an Anthropocene world or a world changed by pervasive anthropogenic human influence. So like what the kind of perennial topics would be issues <coughs> like war, uh, hunger, um, human flourishing and that sort of thing. And now the issues that we face are, are, are much broader than that and, and, and perhaps even more pressing, right, as you kind of argue throughout the book. Yeah, and I would say that those perennial challenges now uh, appear within changing background conditions that are harder to fit into the, the, um, the concepts and frameworks that uh, are, we inherit. Uh, so it's not that those challenges go away or that they're less important. There's, there's you know, w- how to lead a, a flourishing human life, how to respond to human suffering are still absolutely central to um, to, to what it means to, to be a morally reasoning creature. It's just that the context within which those has happened is now also ethically charged in what um, are unprecedented and almost unimaginable ways uh, in our in our received traditions. Yeah, so you argue climate change in particular is an unprecedented unprecedented challenge to our ethics. And um, you, you describe four different uh, kind of reasons why that's the case. There's uh, there's a global issue that this that this impacts literally the entire globe. Uh, the interge- uh, intergenerational asymmetry, the fact that we impact the future in larger ways than perhaps we ever have. Uh, there's conceptual ineptitude, uh, the fact that it's hard to wrap our minds around this problem. And then there's also ongoing radical inequality. So talk for a minute about those four issues and, and how you see them playing out uh, when it comes to climate change. Right. So why climate change is unprecedented is because it's not really a single problem with a discrete solution. In fact, there is no solution to climate change in the sense that there is nothing that humanity can do that will revert us to a condition in which we don't bear responsibility for how a planetary system is functioning. So that in itself is um, daunting, but what it means is that every, every aspect of how to respond to this human influence through Uh, global ecological systems is up for interpretation about what it would look like for humans to have uh, a better or worse participation in those systems, a better or worse influence. So those, those, those four features that I discriminate, those are all different, those are all different aspects of climate change that require um, reasoned moral interpretation of, of how to make sense of them and also are are real challenges for doing so. So, um, yes, the global scale of the problem is is in itself challenging. And what's especially frustrating about the global scale of climate change is that the harms and the incentives don't line up well. So, I mean, it's well known. You know, the people with the most ability to do something about climate change have the least incentive, basically, in the industrialized North Atlantic world. And, and the people who are already being harmed by it have the least ability to do something. So that, that in itself frustrates political action. We see that happening this week in Paris. Um, that's, that's a major challenge built into it. But that's just one of the challenges. That's, that's one aspect that it's a global commons problem. The second is that it's an it's an intergenerational problem. So uh, that same kind of incentive interest asymmetry plays out over time. In other words, future generations are most at risk of climate change and the least ability to do something about it. Present generations always have a disincentive to act meaningfully. Thirdly, uh, it's not clear that we have the appropriate concepts to deal well with climate change. And here's and here's a c- clear example of, of how. Our ordinary ideas of harm and responsibility organize around um, a sort of a, a paradigmatic uh, portrait of one person harming another person in some way, right? So yeah. um, one person hitting another person, that happens and our, and our brains light up. Um, but with climate change, it's, it's, we participate in global structures that in non-linear ways lead to relatively worse outcomes for um, other people in ways that you can't quite trace, like that is very difficult for our brains to track. And it's not, not only clear. globally, but future-wise. Yeah, too, oh yeah, right? absolutely. <laughs> um, is, is that why yeah. people uh, kind of distrust it to begin with? Because a lot of people uh, would be frustrated with this interview already because we've started from the assumption that humans affect climate change, right? So so they, they would want to begin the discussion to even have that be proven. And, and how do you begin with, with those uh, people who have that perspective? That How do you even describe what climate change is in a way that kind of lets them know that humans do impact it? Because there, people have questions about that. 
That's, yeah, that's a good question. I think I would say, look, as a religious studies scholar, I don't have any authority on my own to doubt the overwhelming consensus of, you know, um, decades and decades of, of peer-reviewed science. I think it is, it's important to be able to read what that peer-reviewed science says and, and where are the uncertainties. There are uncertainties in climate science, but the most important uncertainty in climate science is how humans will respond to it, which is to say this, the most important uncertainty in climate modeling right now is what humans will do. That's why those models are uncertain. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's the, that global average temperatures are rising, isn't, there's not any controversy about that. That's a matter of reading thermometers, basically. Um, that humans have um, a causal role in it is almost certain which is to say it would be very difficult to come up with a different causal story about the increased thermal energy in the planet. And, I, you know, I certainly can't imagine what that story would be. And the, the basic thing is we're trapping heat in, right? We're burning stuff. The stuff we burn sends stuff up into the sky. That becomes mm -hmm. a sort of blanket over the earth that you know, the temperature is going to increase in, in, in unprecedented ways. So people that say this is, oh, this must be just be cyclical. The earth yeah. kind of gets hotter, then it gets colder, then it gets hotter. This is unprecedented the way that we're seeing it happen. And, and, it, and it's been traced by scientists to show that humans are impacting this. Like, right. So once we know that we are, then what should we do about it? What would be a fair response? What would be a responsible approach? What would be a just thing to do? Um, yeah, are there trade-offs there? Yeah. Like, are there, you know, are we going to confront climate change in a way that disadvantages poor people today? Because Precisely. we're going to say, oh well, poor people in the future, there won't be people in the future. So sorry for the poor people today. That kind of a thing. Precisely, those are very important trade-offs, and it's not obvious how you resolve them. Investments now to avoid future risks that would putatively. Um, d distract resources from the from the current poor. That's an interesting moral question. I have to say, you know, it's not like that's actually a lively point of debate. It's not like <laughs> the world is interested in devoting massive resources to alleviating human poverty now. Yeah, yeah right. Um, and that, that it would then shift those resources to avoiding future risks of vulnerable. But nonetheless, it's still an important moral question. Yeah, and that's interesting. It is more of a moral question than an actual active life, like practical question. Yet. Yeah. Uh, so before we go on with that, let's talk about, um, because you use ethics as the category, and, and uh, ethics to some people seems like a secular category, but obviously ethics um, is tied up with religion as well. So I want to uh, talk about that, and to some people it might seem like you hide the idea of religion in the subtitle here, the future of ethics and uh, religious creativities in, in the subtitle there. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts about religion and its relationship to the secular when it comes to ethical questions well I guess I'm using ethics in a in, um, in, an, in an intentionally generic sense that is any kind of reflection on why humans act as they do or how humans should act and I think that that kind of question will be inevitably answered by the inheritances that people have at hand in order to think through questions about how to live a human life or how a, how a, a community should take shape, how a community should organize itself. Um, and for uh, many people, those inheritances will be um, deep religious traditions, but not everyone. And the question of how to lead a good human life or, or what is the meaning of a, of a mortal creaturely existence is one that I think many people can recognize and that, um, you know, by framing it in the generic space of ethics, it actually allows there to be um, deeper and um, more intense religious exchange both within traditions and between traditions. And, and, and you know, that's, that's what I'm interested in. I mean, I'm not sure, this, would I call it a secular space? Um, I don't think I'd call it secular in the sense that Secular spaces are, I mean, you know, as you know, there's lively academic discussion over what the right. secular mean, but here's one way to think about it. Secular means um, a space in which um, discussion of the views of the human good or purpose are specifically excluded. And, I'm, and, and what ethics does is put that back on the table in part so that we can think about the inheritances we have to think through these, you know, deepest human questions. So kind of what you're d describing uh, is the project of the book, and, and you label it as pluralist inquiry. Uh, here's something that you write. You say, we should let our moral worlds remain plural, and we should seek border-crossing projects 
and bridge building discussions to support cooperative action on shared problems. So in essence, this is a this is a global problem that, that requires a global solution. Mm -hmm. But we live in a world where there are people with different worldviews, different religions, no religion, uh, and, and that sort of thing. And as a Christian, you obviously uh, are, are tied to the fundamental truths of your own faith. But rather than uh, seeking everyone's conversion to it, in this book you argue for pluralist inquiry. That's what you call it. What you write is, uh, you write, we should let our moral worlds remain plural and seek border crossing projects and bridge building discourses that support cooperative action on shared problems. So some some of the more secular minded people then might, might wonder why you're bothering to bring in these ant antiquated ideas of religion in, into a, what should be a scientific discussion that brackets those things. And then there are some religious people and Christians in particular who might uh, worry that you're letting science dictate your interpretation of the gospel. So your project seems to have uh, potential critics on both sides of you there, where secular people say, don't bring your religion in here, and religious people say, don't water down my gospel with your liberal stuff here. Yeah. No, I mean, my project has critics on all kinds of sides, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, and let me, let me add to the potential critical camp. I mean, <laughs> um, in uh, an, another view that I'm attempting to, re to reject are, are those that think that focusing on global problems requires that we adopt a single worldview before we before we get to them, and that may not be a religious worldview. I mean, I think that there's a there's a strand of this in contemporary environmentalism that that we need to sort of convert cultures to a contemporary environmental worldview in order to be able to adequately address problems. Um, and and I'm so by staking out a more pluralist approach, I'm saying I I don't think that's the right place to begin. I want to begin from the challenges themselves. And let me explain it this way: um, the the that that sentence you just read, what came in a chapter on global ethics. And, you know, the big question in, in global ethics is how can a species with many moral worlds, many religious traditions, many cultural views, find shared ground to cooperate when it has shared challenges? And what I'm simply saying is that we don't need to identify um, a a consensus foundation before turning to those challenges. We might turn to those challenges with whatever traditions and inheritances we have to make sense of them, attempt to cooperate with others, and in that cooperation, we'll likely begin to build vocabularies of um, argument, at least the, voc the, um, the amount of shared understanding or shared concern that helps us have an argument in the first place. And, um, but, and I mean that um, not just for the, the big wicked problems like climate change, but also for um, the more immediate and perennial ones like human poverty, like child malnourishment. Uh, there's no reason that we should live in a world with chronic child malnourishment. I think that many people from many traditions think that that's true. And I think that we don't need to really um, agree on the universal reasons for that first. We could probably enter into shared projects attempting to meaningfully confront it and then argue over what kinds of uh, beliefs and, and views and commitments that one needs to have to, to adequately sustain those commitments. It's a, 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 maybe a simplified way of putting it would be it's as it's, it's though uh, you've got a group of people in a room, uh, trapped in a room that's slowly filling up with water. And the people can have an argument about whether the room is located in a hotel or whether it's located uh, out in the middle of the desert in its own building or whatnot. Or you can decide to try to do something about the water that's filling up the room kind of a thing. And, and as you're doing that, as you're confronting that problem, these, you know, this other question about where the building is located, some of these wider questions can be discussed and, and you can build trust by actually working practically on this particular problem that's threatening your well-being here. Is that kind of a simplified way of putting what you're describing. No, it makes complete sense. And, you know, and among the, among the, shared, yes, among the shared assumptions there is that we're in a building and that there's water. And then it's rising, and just that, just that, that provides, I think, a kind of provisional, shared ground to then have more meaningful and deeper conversations that should not be suppressed. I hasten to add, yeah, um, they should come to bear. They just need to come to bear in the most helpful and productive ways. So I think that answers the, especially the the, the concerns that religious people would have that by talking about this, we're avoiding uh, gospel issues or uh, conversion to Christ is taking a back seat. Um, 
because you're saying those conversations need to continue and those conversations have an important place. In fact, we'll touch on that toward the end of the interview, but you're also arguing that we face such large scale problems right now that we should also spend some time really focusing on practical things we can do about those problems now, regardless of shared and different worldviews overall. That is true, and let me, but let me deepen the religious stakes to that. I think that, that those spaces where humanity is facing planetary challenges are for religions of all kinds, probably some of the most important missional spaces that exist. You have to be able to show how your tradition, how your good news is in fact good news in this troubled, difficult space. Um, I mean, and I, I think that's kind of a missional commitment of my own. I think that that's where the most important um, spaces of um, theological engagement exist. You, you, it could be rooted in, in James, right, in the New Testament, where he talks about true religion is you know, actually helping somebody today kind yeah. of a thing, rather than not that eternity doesn't matter, yeah. but that this is what God's given us today. We should focus on Sure. On that. Yeah, but I, maybe, maybe I mean even this. Um, so what does so what is <laughs> Christianity argues over what it means to love God and love neighbor, right? Um, and it's not obvious what it how it is meaningful to say that we love our neighbors in a world in which there is chronic and avoidable ch- child malnourishment. And so we need to begin to show the intelligibility of that commitment in that space. And insofar as we do that, I think we enter into meaningful, even missional conversations with people of other traditions. So we have to show how our faith actually gets food in people's stomachs and how it alleviates those problems. Yeah, I mean, unless, unless one wants to claim that one's faith has nothing to do with the suffering of children. Right. Sure, go for it. Right. I just don't think yeah. that that's going to be a, um, an interesting, lasting, or a very effective evangelism policy. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so, as we said before, there, there are a lot of people uh, in the United States that have uh, deep-seated suspicions about uh, issues like climate change. And, and you write that even, even some of the religious people who do uh, care about climate change and, and want to be involved in the conversation have been long on critique and short on creative possibility. Uh, uh, so talk about that indictment a little bit about um, where Christian ethicists have been on this question. So I think there's a, there's a temptation that uh, religious thinkers of all kinds have when we come to address environmental issues. Um, and I do don't, I don't not mean to say this approach is wrong, just that it can lead to easy, deceptively easy diagnoses. Um, there's, a, there's a famous critique of Christianity by the medieval historian Lynn White called uh, The Historical Roots of Our Ecologic Crisis, published in 1967, in which he essentially blames the worldview of of medieval Christianity for for giving rise to the uh, assumptions of modernity that let humanity exploit the earth. Set off an absolute firestorm of of debate. He basically said Christianity is to blame for current e- ecological issues, that the worldview of Christianity. The worldview of Christianity yeah. is, and even people who are not Christian in the modern world have inherited the axioms of that worldview, even if they're not Christian anymore. Right. So it's a, it was, a, it was um, a deeply productive indictment. It was probably the best thing that could have happened to religionists and especially Christian ethicists because it basically said environmental problems are at root religious problems, and the only way to address them is to get to that religious depth. And that call has been taken up with great enthusiasm <laughs> by generations of um, theological thinkers on the environment. Um, and I include myself here. We are all too happy to say, yes, environmental problems are symptomatic of a fundamental question of belief. And here I have a therapy for that, a theological therapy. Um, and what I worry about is not that that is completely wrong. I think that that is nonetheless that is still um, an, an important and interesting approach to, to interpreting environmental problems. What I worry is that if we only focus on those deep cosmological roots of environmental problems, we don't address the particularity of the actual problems we face. So, for example, I found myself having written a first book on Christian theology and environment. I found that I had nothing interesting to say about climate change in particular. Just to say that, um, all I could say is that... um, This is the book Ecologies of Greece. So having nothing interesting to say, I thought, um, made made me question that entire approach. And and I just think um, religious ethicists ought to have a sense of how our diagnoses 
make a difference for the messy pluralist conflicts taking place within cultures over environmental problems. That's Willis Jenkins. He's Associate Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Virginia, and as he mentioned, uh, he's the author of a book called Ecologies of Grace, and then a book that uh, takes a completely different approach uh, called The Future of Ethics. So let's talk about that completely different approach a little bit more then. So you kind of started out with your previous book trying to do a cosmological uh, approach, and that makes sense because as you mentioned, one of the reasons religion, uh, religious people got involved in the conversation to begin with is due to these uh, st kind of stinging critiques from people saying, look, these religious ideas are affecting people's views of the environment, whether people are religious or not. They're an inheritance of our culture today, and they're causing problems. And so religious thinkers thought, oh, oh dear, you know, we definitely don't want our religion to be <laughs> implicated in this in terrible things that are happening. So we need to show that there are these, that there are other uh, cosmologies, uh, religious cosmologies, uh, that are all that are alternate to these bad ones that kind of cause the bad stuff, uh, and so you you took that approach. But then uh, now you're taking an approach that you that you call prophetic pragmatism or theocentric pragmatism. Uh, so let's let's have you unpack those a little bit more: the cosmological strategy versus the uh, the prophetic pragmatism. Right. So cosmological strategies, in my view are those that, that start from um, the, the sense that uh, modern environmental problems, problems of any sort, uh, arise from fundamental worldviews and that some kind of repair in fundamental worldviews is necessary in order to address those problems. That means that um, there's a rather intense religious moment before a society or a community can come to address a problem. It has to re-examine its worldview, maybe dispense with its worldview, adopt a different one. Um, and I thought um, two things. First of all, I thought, uh, that seems unlikely. Uh, w is it, if it is the case that in order to address the racist distribution of toxins in the United States, that first of all, there has to be an outbreak of um, a minority theological strand of cosmology across, you know, contemporary <laughs> United States. It's just like, well, that's never going to get solved. Yeah. But then secondly, I wondered, well, is it really the case that um, cultural behavior is so simply explained by background worldviews? Most people, I mean, outside of, of um, academic religionists can't really articulate what their fundamental worldview is and make it all come together into a coherent picture, right? Our behavior, they don't really need to. Yeah, they don't need to. Yeah, in order to survive, they're just... Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, our behavior is sort of um, all already made for us by the communities in which we exist. Um, and so anyway, I thought, um, well, what if, we, what if we start from the other side? What if we work from... Um, from communities that are attempting to address those problems with um, their own traditions, um, however imperfectly, and see what those concepts do as they are stressed by the problems they're attempting to face. So you're saying, okay, so let's let's take a look at the at problems people are actually facing, and then how they make use of their faith to address those problems. And that's the interesting thing about religion is its flexibility in in kind of addressing current problems, and you mentioned the race issue. So there's this, there's this stunning chapter on race and environmental issues. And in, in, in a nutshell, you tell the stories of, of some black communities, especially uh, in lower income areas, who have suffered due to the offloading of toxic waste and garbage, either at or near their communities, right? There's this idea of, well, we have this toxic stuff, we need to put it somewhere. Oh, here's this area that's not very developed. Mm -hmm. and, and we're just going to dump it over there. And then it causes these health issues in the communities. And you right. noticed how those communities were reacting uh, and using their religion to react, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, um, it's, it's one of the lesser known things about American in environmentalism and especially um, religion in American environmentalism. Um, the discovery that the greatest statistical predictor of toxic waste sightings in the United States is race. That discovery was made possible by a United Church of Christ report in 1987. And that report um, came out of um, um, civil rights protests in, in North Carolina that were informed by um, the Southern Christian Leadership Council, um, you know, Martin Luther King's organization. Uh, and, and it remains the case that environmental justice efforts in local communities all across the United States are often organized with 
um, religious institutions as support. And it turns out, sociologists say, that um, with l leadership by women of color who are faithful people, right? So religious women of color are some of the most important uh, environmental leaders in this country. And yet that is rarely seen because they're not seen as being either environmental or religious. They're seen as being, um, you know, advocates for community health or something like that. And throughout that chapter, you also raised the, the uh, these two competing ideas that environmentalists have, uh, the anthropocentric and the ecocentric uh, versions of environmentalism. And anthropocentric meaning your perspective kind of prioritizes humans. Uh, and ecocentric, which some would say diminishes the role of humans. Talk a little bit more about that now and how it plays out in that chapter, the anthropocentric versus the ecocentric environmentalisms. Yeah, this will take just a couple minutes to unpack, but it's really important. And it also lets people know that environmentalism isn't just this unified movement. There are different ideas, even within environmentalism, that there are debates ongoing there as well. Absolutely, and that, that is one of the most important things to learn from environmental justice movements. Let me start from, from some background conflict between environmental justice movements and, and what they call mainstream environmentalism in the United States. Um, so mainstream environmentalism in the United States, you might think of um, the Sierra Club or other kinds of conservationist organizations like that. In the views of environmental justice advocates, they have been um, mainly concerned with protecting wild nature, nature where there, isn't, where there aren't any people, and protecting nature from human influence or human relations in any way. Um, and so has been animated by a concern that um, our society is too anthropocentric, it's too human-centered, it needs to become more ecocentric, it needs to recognize the intrinsic value of non-human nature, and really been focused on that program of cultural reform. The reason why environmental justice advocates have disagreed with that, with that focus, is because they think it it ends up ignoring all the ways in which vulnerable people are harmed by environmentally mediated risks, like toxins that show up in their backyards and in their, in their bodies. Um, so they're interested in recovering a form of, of anthropocentrism. I might call it an ecologically expanded human-centeredness. They're interested in the ways that um, our bodies are ecologically permeable and the ways that political power pushes risks and resources through ecological flows and into our bodies, which is to say that we are, we're all ecologically vulnerable to the dominant power arrangements of our society, which shows like up... You're going to find mercury in your blood, for example. And you're much more likely to find mercury in your blood if you're a Native American. Right. Um, so, which is to say that, um, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, that... Um, the landscape of white supremacy shows up in the distribution of uh, toxic risks in the United States. So some of these groups like the Sierra Club that would say, uh, we want to protect these wildlife preserves, we want yeah. to do this and that, I mean, which is, is, is you know laudable goals, but uh, their concern would be more about that than say, don't put your toxins here, well, it's got to go somewhere. Okay, well, they're not protesting when toxins get deposited next to a a black suburb uh, right. in, out in the East Coast yeah. or something. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I, I should say that the, um, the Sierra Club has, has listened to environmental justice groups and is not quite so monolithically uh, opposed, Good. but, but um, that is the basic view, yes. And in fact, that, um, that protest movement in Warren County, North Carolina, um, in the early 1980s, put the Sierra Club specifically in a really difficult spot because that... Um, that toxic waste siting in a predominantly African-American county happened because of a recent national legislation about, how, about toxic waste that the Sierra Club had pushed hard for. So they were supporting the rollout of this national legislation for dealing with toxic wastes. Um, and, it, and it turned out that the decision-making process ended up with siting this, um, this toxic waste disposal facility in this predominantly African-American community, and then they just didn't know what to do with those local protests, and they felt like they had to support the, the national legislation. And it looks like the lesson to be learned there is, is that um, environmental protection measures will not affect everyone equally. 
Um, they might be a net benefit for everyone, but they might be a, um, a stark net loss for some people in particular. And um, we have to pay attention to uh, those, those trade-offs and the fairness issues involved. And sort of like when, when we talk about um, carbon emissions and we, we want to set global standards for carbon emissions and the United States has already pumped so much into the atmosphere that we're expecting other countries to dial it back when they never reached the levels we were at and therefore never got the same advantages from that, uh, from those emissions. And now we're expecting other people to sort of tamp it down and, and you know, these are the sort of Absol issues of inequality. Absolutely, it's a major climate justice issue. Um, whereas on the whole, for the species considered broadly, it seems to be obvious um, that carbon emissions need to, well, they need to stabilize and then they need to reduce rather quickly for um, humanity's long-term benefit. But in the short term... That's an anthropocentric argument too, right? That's it. For that, humanity's benefit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. That's the, that's the low-hanging fruit for... <laughs> that's an anthropocentric <laughs> argument, absolutely. Um, and, and we might say more about that. Um, but even on those anthropocentric terms, um, that looks like a net net win for humanity, but um, it's, it's, uh, it involves burdens and obligations for many developing peoples, many developing countries, um, who might rightly protest that they didn't cause this problem, and now they're being made to bear outsized uh, burdens of responding to it. Um, so, so, yeah, so anyway, it, um, there's, a, there's a clear question of, of justice. And, and, and I guess here's the thing to say about that. You know, who benefits from a, a global climate policy that's for the net benefit of all humanity? Well, not humanity in general. It looks like um, those who are already wealthy and affluent benefit the most in the long term. So it just turns out that those who did the most to contribute to the problem um, stand to benefit the most from a long-term climate policy, which seems you know, deeply unfair. Couldn't that be an argument against more anthropocentric views then, is this idea that if we're going to go the anthropocentric route, odds are it will go in the direction of favoring uh, wealthier people or people who have benefited the most. Um, but on that question, there's a really interesting quote in the chapter on uh, race and justice uh, issues. And so I'd like to have you comment on this. You write, um, according to weak anthropocentrism, a particular uh, a particular environmentalist view. The human is the interpretive center of this cosmos, but because she is enfleshed in a wider membership in which she must recognize her contingency, on which she is dependent, and from which she understands herself and her purpose, the human is not the moral center. Break that down a little bit. Right, so what I'm, what I'm um, developing there is the possibility that um, a view centered on human interest, what is in humanity's interest, might not be as narrowly materialistic as, um, as popular versions of anthropocentrism or the most popular versions of anthropocentrism would have them. Um, in other words, if we think about, and especially if we think with theological considerations about what is in humanity's deepest interest and who humanity is, um, it might turn out that protecting the ecological communities in which we live, and in fact, even having a kind of intimacy with them, a uh, response to their beauty and a wonder at their ultimate meaning and their creation might be essential to the kinds of creatures that we are. And so there's one kind of anthropocentric argument that says um, it is in our deepest interest, rightly considered, to um, protect earth and all of its creatures because that's who we are um, which is to say um, when we understand ourselves most truly and deeply we understand that we are not the at the center of earth that rather we occupy a niche in which it is our ecological and theological role to care for this community so to tie this to scriptural ideas because this people, uh, religious people often point back to the scriptures as, uh, you know, uh, Genesis obviously provides one of the most used 
proof texts to support the idea that the humans dominate the earth and, and, and that God intended <coughs> that. Um, Genesis lays out a creation uh, of the earth and a creation of humanity, and then humans are given dominion over it. And um, let's talk a little bit about how that uh, scripture can play out in, in what you're proposing with uh, prophetic pragmatism. Sure, yeah, so lots of discussion about how to interpret those first two creation stories in Genesis and their implications for uh, environmental theology. You know, there's this first creation story with those very strong um, uh, dominion verbs um, to subdue and to fill, and, 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 um, and those, are, those, are, those are strong command-like verbs. And then the second creation story it seems so much more agrarian, you know, we're supposed to, the human is to cultivate and and keep or guard. Um, and so one strategy is to privilege the second creation story over the first and say really the second one is, is, the, is the, uh, the better picture, the truer picture, I don't know. Um, I think that that's actually, um, I don't know, it's kind of a cheap <laughs> interpretive strategy. <laughs> there's yeah, clearly two we'll stories. About that one. Yeah. yeah, there's clearly two creation stories there, a Yahwist and an Eloist. They're juxtaposed. By the way, if anybody doesn't know about that, go back and listen to the episode with uh, Ron Handel where we talk about Genesis and the different creation stories. Nice. But go ahead. <laughs> nice. Um, and so... And you think that's a cheap interpretive strategy to just chalk it up to two different accounts, forget one of them and focus on the well, other? Well, certainly forgetting one of them and focusing on the one you like um, without, some, without some stronger interpretive reason for doing so. And there may well be a strong interpretive mm -hmm. reasons for doing so. Um, but focusing on dominion, you know, uh, uh, another theological strategy would be to say, well, what does dominion mean? And um, I like I like the Protestant theologian Karl Barth on this. He's one of the he is um, one of the most anthropocentric, dominion focused, command organized theologians in the tradition. Um, <laughs> he's not the place you go to look for for an ecological ethic. But what what he has to say about dominion is very interesting. Two things: one, um, what's happening there is that humans are given dominion as a witness to God's dominion, which means they don't have some kind of partnership or some kind of you know deputy managerial role over the earth. It's not theirs to control. They just witness to God's dominion, which really um, makes it a much more contingent kind of ecological role. And then secondly, eventually he'll say, well. well where do where do we learn what it means to be a dominus, a lord? Well, you learn it, Christians learn it from the self-revelation of God in Jesus Christ, the servant. And so then the whole thing gets flipped and subvert, subverted so that what it means to exercise dominion is to exercise servanthood. Um, and so I guess I would say any Christian dominion theology has to wrestle with dominion as it looks like in Christ. The place you bring up Genesis in the book is actually in a chapter about desires and um, that was really interesting uh, to bring up the subject of desires because I think this is showcases where religious faith um, plays an important role in the managing of human desires in general so talk about that chapter a little bit about uh, about desires right so I consider I'm thinking about desire in the context of environmentalist and other concerns um, uh, that excessive human desires, either in terms of population or even more so in terms of consumption, are what's driving destruction of the earth. And um, there's a sense in which I, I think that that's probably true, but what I think is interesting about theological approaches to desire, especially Christian approaches to desire, is that um, usually the diagnosis is not that humans want too much, but that they want too little. Um, that they desire um, cheaply material things when they could have infinite things, that they want cheap wealth when they could have true wealth. And so what I think is, um, I think that I'm trying to remember how I use the Genesis passage there. Yeah, so you're talking about it in terms of uh, the human economy has, uh, there's unprecedented scales, uh, uh, we've appropriated unprecedented scales of Earth's economy while generating prosperity for unprecedented human populations. And this follows your quote about be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and so oh, yeah, yeah, dominion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so I, I wanted to engage that. Yeah, I wanted to engage um, that dominionist text because, um, you know, that's, that's a worry that people have. 
about any community that looks to the Hebrew scriptures for its sense of how to interact with earth. And if that's the first thing you see, isn't that the root of the problem? Just go have as many kids as possible yeah. and then take up as much resources as yeah. you need. It'll all be okay. Yeah. And I guess what I want to say is, um, yes, you read that scripture in the context of thinking about what it means to exercise real dominion, what it means to truly um, fill the earth, what it means to seek real wealth. And upon reflection, seeking real wealth is probably not going to look like, um, you know, material riches. Um, and in fact, uh, the way that that, um, as, as I, as I um, understand it, um, the interpretation of those dominion verses in the ancient world was really not focused on a mandate about have ex extending population. It was more interested in the presentation of humanity's place in the cosmos uh, and sort of what the human purpose overall was. And I think that that has been lost in some kind of, you know, proof texting, both critical and apologetic proof, text, proof texting of those, those dominion verses. That's Willis Jenkins. He's <coughs> Associate Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Virginia. And he joins me here at the Maxwell Institute today. Uh, he wrote the book, The Future of Ethics, Sustainability, Social Justice, and Religious Creativity. Um, so toward the end of the book, um, you revisit the intergenerational issue that you raised toward the beginning. That's the, the fact that with an issue like climate change, we're impacting people that haven't even been, been born yet. We limit the possibilities of the future, and, and we possibly even set people up for eventual catastrophe. And there are different models that ethicists use uh, when they're thinking about the obligations that we have to people who aren't even born yet. And it's a really difficult issue to tackle, and there are a few different models. So I kind of wanted you to talk about the strengths and weaknesses of a few of those that you bring up and, and kind of how they intersect with, uh, with, Christian, with, a Christian out, uh, with the outlook of, of Christians. I don't want to speak as though there's one particular Christian outlook. Sure. Um, sure. So there's the investment model, intergenerational membership, and precautionary. Uh, go ahead and talk about those. Yeah, and let me start off by saying that here's a place where I think that theological reflection is especially interesting because, if anything, um, members of religious communities usually understand themselves as members of an intergenerational tradition, as something that they have inherited and something that they um, really want to pass on to future generations of this tradition. And I think that there are probably implicit ways of thinking about how Christians understand themselves as members of, you know, a communion of saints or um, a universal church or whatever it is. Um, that, that get at some of the difficulties of thinking about intergenerational economic and ecological problems that bedevil um, secular rationalities. And two of those rationalities, um, the, uh, especially the ones that you, you see the most often in relationship to climate change, are um, rights-based approaches to, to intergenerational problems. So do future generations have rights? Can they make claims on the present generation? Intuitively, many people want to say yes, but then it really confuses conventional uses of rights ideas. Future people don't exist yet. They're virtual. They're not... And, and, and who they are and how they exist depends on the actions that we take. That's a very funny kind of relation that's hard to get your mind around with. You can start getting into like hypothetical current people who haven't ever been born. Did, yeah. Do they have rights? Yeah. That they could have been born or yeah. that they should have been, you know. Yeah. So and then like what is the strength of those rights? Yeah. Really? I mean, so it really, it's not clear how helpful that is for articulating an intuitive sense that we have obligations to future generations. The dominant model, the most important for climate change is the investment model, which is to say um, the cost-benefit analysis model and the most important idea there is um, Discounting, in other words, um, how weighty within our prudential analyses should um, costs or risks to future generations be held, um, and this seems like an incredibly wonky. Yeah, this was tough <clears throat> to wrap my head around. But I, I, I want to dwell on this because it's hugely important. Like future worlds are being made around how discount rates are being set, like. Decisions about what, who is setting these, first of all. Like, very important question. That's what I'm like. All right, so like, before we get that, like, who's doing this? Well, this is really important. So there's a, and, so, and this is really important for, um, for religious ethicists to pay attention to. And I guess one reason I wanted to dwell on the wonky is because I think we skip over this too easily. Um, and so there's a really interesting debate 
between the American economist Bill Nordhaus at Yale and, um, and the British economist Nicholas Stern in the UK. Stern wrote um, something called the Stern Report on Climate Change. which was an economic analysis of climate change. Nordhaus is a climate modeler. And they have famously different ways of setting what should be the social cost of carbon. In other words, basically how to internalize the amount of harm that um, our, our, our current greenhouse gas emissions are causing. How to internalize it? So, um, um, one way of thinking about climate change is that it is a um, market failure. That is to say that it's all of its costs are external to our everyday ways of doing business, which is to say that um, in the ways that we use energy, we don't pay its full costs. We offload those costs onto, usually onto future generations. Because and, and temperature is going to be worse for them. It's not changing the temperature right now as, I mean, it is. What was a better way to put that? Um, we're not feeling the effects of what the temperature is going to be like 15 years down the road, but they will. Right. So, if we have, so yeah, if we have a national climate policy that causes sea level rise that will cost um, you know, uh, a future coastal community $100 million to deal with, we're not paying the cost of that. Right. We're just offloading it to them, yeah. right? And the economists, mo almost all economists, conservative, liberal, whatever, they are all agreed that you want markets to internalize true costs. Um, so take into account the fact that it's going to be costing that much yeah. to the future. But the big question is, how do you weight those current and those future costs yes. in current dollars. how much does it yeah so how much yeah right okay so so nor so yes yeah, so that, that's how you set the cost of, of the social cost of carbon so here so here's the where the big debate is and this is why it's important that, that everyone pays attention to it is um nordhaus basically thinks that um market behavior can and rightly does set the the discount rate i mean how so don't change anything well, uh, whether look to the performance of bonds to know whether to set the discount rate at one or two or three percent, to know how much to to charge that hundred million dollars fifty years from now in future costs, because it's not going to be a hundred million. If we see a hundred million dollars, a hundred million dollars of cost is going to happen fifty years from now. We're not going to put that in our current decision making framework at hundred million. We're going to put it in at hundred million uh, at three percent discount rate. It's going to be much less, right? Well, anyway. Um, uh, you can see the problem right away. It means that the discount rate has this massive impact on current policy. And and Stearns basically says this. Um, we need to have political and moral discussion about what we th about how to set the discount rate in view of how we think about our obligations to future generations, which is incredible. He's saying we should have a a wide ranging cultural and political discussion about how we understand our obligations to future generations and then have that inform these policy instruments that that um, will set uh, how we respond to problems like climate change. And who conducts that conversation though? Yeah, right. Well, well, well this is precisely what someone like Nordhaus would say. Yeah. How are you going to have that conversation? Yeah. Let's just look to the bond markets. Yeah, well, and I, <laughs> one of them, here's the irony though, is you're a pragmatist. That seems more pragmatic to say, how is it going to, how will it f affect rationally behaving humans today? What's the bottom line? Uh, instead of getting in, and, I, and I, I think the bigger conversation certainly should happen, but I'm thinking in terms of likelihood, and it just does, it doesn't seem that likely. It seems more likely that people will just make decisions based on how it's going to affect their pocket today. Oh, right. Well, then that's what you want. So um, uh, I think for any effective climate policy, you absolutely have to get a price on carbon because you don't want everyone think, walking around thinking, how can I make individual decisions that will be best for long-term climate outcomes? You want them to be make, acting in their rational self-interest. So but just knowing that um, that energy costs are this much and gas prices are this much, right? Um, and so then it, mm -hmm. it's, it's automatic. But but that sort of the system is set by macro policy decisions, and those macro policy decisions have very important assumptions about how we relate to future generations. And the big question is, should assumptions about how we relate to future generations be determined? within a market framework, or can political and ethical ideas come to bear on them? At the very least, I think, upon reflection, like if we sit down in a seminar room and think um, about actions that lead to future costs and how we think about um, the, the, the hopes and, and sense of relationship we have with future generations, 
um, we're likely to think that they're not reflected well in our current collective decision making. Mm -hmm. So what do you propose? Well, I propose that we have a conversation that we're not having, that we have arguments that we're not having. And one reason we're not having the arguments is because I think that um, religious and ethical thinkers skip over those wonky things um, because they seem too weird or they just they just, we just reject them out of hand like ah it's just market thinking yeah. um, and we I don't think that's helpful about cosmology instead yeah, and inculcate right. values through stories and I don't think that's totally helpful either but um, one thing that here's a place where cosmologies and stories come back into the picture mm -hmm. um, um, it makes a huge difference what narrative or broad story we think we are participating in when we imagine our relationship to future generations. Indigenous peoples have been especially interesting and confrontational around this. You know, if they, they a, num a number of indigenous councils have, have presented views in which they present themselves as being members of an ongoing intergenerational community, the whole intergenerational community of which is affected by uh, environmental degradation of various kinds. Um, and just that imagination, even if someone doesn't agree with it or hold it, just that imagination um, can um, bear on the ways that, that a broader dominant culture thinks about um, its relationship to future generations. If only it makes us think about that. Where does Christianity play a part in that exact conversation, would you say? Um, not nearly robust <laughs> enough of a role, I would say. Um, and so, um, in that in that chapter, you know, I really, um, you know, all throughout the book, I'm trying to work with theological projects already underway. And in that chapter, I really find myself um, um, trying to make an argument with thinner ground. Like there's, there, it's it's not obvious where this happens. But one place it does happen implicitly is in worship services. Because what happens in many worship services is that, so I'm, I'm Episcopal at the, in the Anglican tradition, liturgical tradition, and in my tradition especially, this liturgical tradition, um, the liturgy is shaped in a way that one feels that one is um, part of a long tradition of saints, a long community of saints that has gone before. And in some traditions, especially Eastern Orthodox, um, a sense that the whole community of saints gathers around the communion table with that congregation, um, which is a, you know, it's a powerful and lovely image. And as I was writing the book, actually, I participated in this, um, this All Saints liturgy. And in, and in the church I, I was attending then, I was, it was in New Haven, I live in Charlotte now. Um, in this church, uh, it, was, it was a tradition to process around and around the church many times chanting out the names of um, the martyrs and of witnesses and of deceased members of that church, just call, just remembering them and, and sort of in a sense being with them in witness to the mystery at the center of that church. And I thought, wow, this is so powerful for thinking about, you know, who we are, who what we inherit and who we are in their company and also in how we be, we are already in, you know, I guess in God's eyes, part of that company um, with future generations as well. That is to say, um, that church anticipates future generations and, and wants them to be um, a certain kind of people, people who witness and participate in that community. And, um, you know, I'm not sure what, the, you know, now ask me, so what's the consequence of that for the discount rate? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it, what it does is that kind of deep imagination that cosmology even um, has a has a way of forcing um, a broader pluralist, maybe even post-Christian society to think about how it imagines relations to future generations. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we come back. We're going to take a brief break. We'll come back with Willis Jenkins, associate professor of religious studies and at the University of Virginia. He's the author of The Future of Ethics, Sustainability, Social Justice, and Religious Creativity. Uh, we'll come right back with the conclusion of the interview. Do you have questions or doubts about your faith? You're not alone. Many faithful members wonder about aspects of LDS Church history, belief, or practice. Everyone needs a reliable and faithful place to work through questions. The Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship and Deseret Book 
offer such a place in a book called Planted, Belief and Belonging in an Age of Doubt by Patrick Mason. Planted offers an empathetic, practical, and candid perspective for people struggling with questions and people who love those who struggle. Planted is available now at Deseret Book and online retailers like Amazon.com. We're speaking with Willis Jenkins today on the Maxwell Institute podcast about religion, climate change, the humanities, and science, and all sorts of things. Um, the book, you hold out the frightening possibility in this book that, uh, that humanity faces some catastrophe in the future, uh, and you make the final argument that religious belief could matter, could still matter in such a case, be, in that it could preserve the possibility of the future to forgive uh, past generations that uh, that messed things up so badly. So, can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. Uh, so this picks up a, a thought that the book opens with something you asked about at the opening of this interview about the complex challenge of climate change. The complexity of climate change offers us in the present generation incentives to deny that it's a problem and also incentives to take weak or inadequate action and deceive ourselves into thinking that it is important action. The philosopher uh, Stephen Gardner, who's, who's written very well about climate change, um, calls this the moral corruption. That it's the kind of problem that um, sort of facilitates moral corruption of, the, of that sort. And you know, looking around, it's obvious that there's all kinds of self-interested denialism, and self-interested token action, and weak gestures. And when I think about the kind of world that my son will inherit, I realize that it is not the world that my own faith and most robust commitments would want him to inherit. Mm -hmm. And I don't have, um, I'm sorry to say as I end the book, you know, um, uh, gleaming optimism that there will be uh, the kind of transformation that will allow him to inherit a just and beautiful world. I'm not predicting catastrophe. I mean, I think it's somewhere in between, probably some muddled in between. So then I thought, well, what do I want my son and future generations to inherit, well, I want them to, I often think, I want my son, at least, to see that in the midst of this, I tried my best to not be deceived and not give in to implicit denialism or cheap tokenism, and that I tried to make my commitments and my faith matter for this world. And if that happens, then at least he will inherit that witness. At least he will inherit the ideas, the beliefs, the commitments that makes sense of the failure of my generation. And that might be the most important thing that we can pass on. So the future of ethics, it's, uh, to be frank, it's a difficult book. It's, it's highly conceptual. Uh, it's not really for beginners. And, and it might only impact right now um, more academically inclined people. Um, but you're arguing for a project that's a lot wider than that, that, uh, that doesn't need that level of theory uh, for everybody to be involved. So I'm wondering what you're working on um, in terms of things that are a little bit more accessible. What kind of projects and resources uh, you would refer to even if you're not personally working on them. I think it, there, there are a lot of different roles that a lot of people need to play. Uh, and so what kind of projects and resources would you refer listeners to who want to know more about discounting or want to know more about what they can do in their personal lives to uh, reduce their carbon footprint or th those types of things yeah no very fair, very fair question you know for um, a pragmatic book um, it looks fairly metanormative and it and it is um, because the argument of the book is really trying to shift background conceptions of the kinds of arguments that matter right and so then you have to do lots of background kinds of argument. And it's a double thing because yeah. you have to convince uh, more secular-minded people that religious perspectives can yeah. really help, and I think you do a good job of that. And, and I think there are a lot of secular-minded people that would agree with that, mm -hmm. but you also have to convince religious people that you're yeah. not just watering down their faith. And so you kind Oh, of the audiences in the book are, are, are several. Um, right, so I'm trying to um, convince people in the broad pluralist field of religion and ecology that they, um, they should think about their style of argument and be more 
um, grounded and practical. I'm trying to convince Christian theologians in particular that what I'm doing is um, not pragmatism of the of the you know the bluntest sort. That it's not mere instrumentalism. That this yeah, some, I have some to offer people it. don't like that. It's right. Pragmatic means you don't even really believe in Christ. You're right. just using that as a tool to accomplish something. Right. Else. So I, there's a theological argument there. Um, the, the theocentric pragmatism bit. I'm presenting arguments to um, environmental scientists broadly about how to think about cultural, including religious dimensions and the problems that they're working on. I'm um, trying to show the, the role of religious arguments in um, pluralist discussions of global ethics. There's lots of different conversations and I'm trying to expand all of them and, and link them. So yeah, that makes for a complicated project that's not for not for all readers and I, you know, I had no hopes that this would become you know, a New York Times bestseller. <laughs> um, what that means is I guess I'm really trying to um, encourage, empower, celebrate all those people who are already working in various ways to show how the communities in which they're a part are making some kind of sense uh, of daunting problems, of daunting challenges, and to, and to really say what they're doing is deeply important. Um, and that they don't have to sort of know the political or religious program in order to know what to do. They just have to look to who their communities are and what resources they have for focusing on those challenges. And then that doesn't, that doesn't mean to say that's it. Like that's where the process begins. And then you enter into a critical dialogue about um, what this community has to respond to climate change. You know, um, the climate scientist Mike Holmes has written this great book, Why We Disagree About Climate Change in which he basically documents his own movement from being a very science-minded person to someone who continues to be quite science-minded, but also sees the role that cultures broadly play in responding to climate change and basically just says, um, stop asking what you can do about climate change and instead ask what climate change can do for you, which is to say, <laughs> what can climate change do for your community? Like, so for Christians, how? here's a question, like, how can climate change help you understand who Jesus is or, or the love of neighbors more. Like, it can do that. Figure out how. Yeah, climate change can pose issues that make you have to reconsider what it means to love your neighbor and how yeah. to actually... Right. So find practical ways to think through. Use use your religious faith and tradition to think through issues that are pressing right now. Right. And, and, and get creative. That kind of brings the role of, uh, or the, the, uh, the point you raised about moral incompetence, which was surprising to see... Uh, you talk about this idea that uh, it, moral incompetence, meaning we're not Christianity hasn't quite been up to the task of climate change, but you, you don't you see that as a blessing and a curse. Uh, that that um, it's bad because it means we're not quite doing everything that can be done, but it's good because why? Right. You know. So when I first when I first um, wrote when I first used the concept moral incompetence, I meant it somewhat pejorative. Uh, pejoratively, I wrote it out of frustration, but then I came to see I really meant something more like non-competence, just that this tradition has never before faced a problem like this. How could it be competent? Um, it will become competent as it figures out ha what resources it has to respond to that problem, which is to say, okay, it's not clear what loving neighbors means in non-linear intergenerational systems. But when we try to figure out what, what love of neighbor looks like in conditions of climate change, then we discover more deeply what it always has meant. There's, there's so much more to talk about, now, but we are out of time, and I'm really glad that, that you were able to stop by today. It was a pleasure, and I, I thank you for um, the conversation. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast. Don't forget to check out our survey at bit.ly slash survey, or click the link on the blog post for this episode. We'd really appreciate your feedback. 